you're turning your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> no safe place to cough when you're wearing one of these things. <coughs> Matthew 5. We are back on track to go through the book of Matthew now. It may take us three or four weeks. Matthew 5, we're going to pick up in verse 21. Last time we were in Matthew 5, we left off at 20. 21, and we're going to finish out, <coughs> pardon me, the chapter, but not today. We'll, it'll be a two-parter. <coughs> we're going to go through verse 32 today, 21 through 32. This morning I want to preach to you a sermon I've entitled, Teaching Contrast. Jesus highlights the difference between Jewish tradition and kingdom living. We're going to look at six topics this, this in the next couple of weeks. Six topics that range from uh, protection of human life, deal with family life, which certainly has an impact on our social life, and then lastly, love for all human beings. And we're in the Sermon on the Mount, and of course, again, the greatest sermon ever preached. And why Jesus chose these six topics, I don't know, but he's Christ, and so it was perfect. Amen? And so as we look, again, anytime we deal with sin, church, we will not be a place that avoids dealing with sin. Amen? <clears throat> You may see yourself in one more than the other. You may not see yourself in any. I doubt it. But here's what I want to admonish you with this morning. We are so, I talked to our group Wednesday night about this. <clears throat> we exchange our own application for applying it to others. We will hear something and go, oh, Boy, they really need to hear that. Listen, as we go through these three topics this morning, just let the Spirit speak to your heart. I'm not interested in what you know about anybody else or how you might think of anybody else. Let the Lord speak to your heart this morning as we look at these three topics, beginning in verse 21. You've heard, it's, you've heard it, that it was said to those of old... You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. <clears throat> Goodness. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a call shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge and the judge hand you over to the officer and you be thrown in the prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there until you have paid the last penny. You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye shall call, sh causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Father, this morning already as we've heard the reading of your word, Lord, I'm sure you have pricked our hearts Father, because we're all guilty in so many ways. Father, I pray today that we might just be still before your spirit. Lord, that we might hear from him. 
that we might be conformed to the image of Christ Jesus. Father, have your way this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, I want you to know Jesus is not opposing the law. Go back to verse 20. He says, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the fair scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And so he wants to talk about today the idea or the, or the, the uh, understanding about sin that exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees. And so he begins this contrast and almost all these I'll follow the same pattern. We're going to look at the attitude, the adjustment in his teaching, and then the action that he gives us. All, the, all of them will fall into that except the one about uh, marriage. But let's look together this morning first the contrast about murder. Notice what he says the, the attitude is in verse 21. You shall not commit murder, right? Whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. First, the defining of it is, is to senselessly take the life of a human being that is the uh, the definition of murder but notice not only the definition of it the doom he says you shall be in danger of judgment in other words if you commit murder you will be subject to the law you'll be subject to the law now I want you to know that before this the Pharisees and the scribes got a hold of the law the law was not soft at all what was the law concerning murder in Genesis 9 6 we see it Numbers 35, 30, we see it. It was a life for life. Now, I don't know how you feel about capital punishment this morning, but I want to say something to you. Soft law leads to soaring crime. That was God's word, not mine. That's not my law. That's his law. That's how God established it. And here we have this attitude that, well, you know, some people may deserve to die. I want to say to you this morning, God is very, very serious about human life. He's very, very serious about human life. And as a matter of fact, today in our culture, today especially in our country, we have reduced human life to a procedure. So the attitude was what it was. But notice the adjustment. Now this is the the whole crux of these six points that we're going to see Jesus, he, he moves the, the focus from the external to the internal. He is heightening, he's heightening the idea of what we consider sin. It's easy, and here's what we do as, as even church members as a body. We love to judge the externals. Listen, you look around this morning, you go, oh, everybody's in church. Well, listen, that doesn't mean your heart's here. You can't know the heart of yourself, even of your brothers and sisters in Christ. So I want us to stop being so externally focused and focus today on our heart. That's where God's focused. That's where God's focused. By the time it manifests itself outwardly, much has been done inwardly that could have been presented. And we're going to see that in just a moment. Jesus focused on things that prompt murder. First, he talks about murder in the temper temper he says uh, I, I say to you whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment <clears throat> murder in the temper how many of you how many of you've murdered in the temper before not one hand's going to come up we say oh, I've never killed anyone have you wanted to I don't, I don't mean that in a joking fashion, but have we ever, th listen, this word anger here means a smoldering anger. Y'all know what happens to a smoldering fire left unattended, right? The kind of anger that's not just a momentary thing and you're over it in a minute, it's that type of anger that just begins to burn, that has a work in you. Hebrews says it this way, 12, 14, and 15. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. The root of bitterness. 
this morning what Jesus is, is what he was saying on the mountain that day and what he's saying to us this morning is attend to the root and there'll never be a fruit attend to the thing inside of you that's causing this that may manifest itself in this and then we'll never see it outwardly so he begins first with the, the murder and the temper but then he talks about the murder and the tongue and I'm not going to go at, in depth this morning to the, to the raka and fool, one is, one is slander, one is just a contempt, contemptuous word, raka, literally means an empty head, dummy, numbskull, whatever you want to say, that variation of it. And then when he talks about calling someone a fool, it goes a little bit further than that. It's really implying that somebody is a godless fool. But I'm not going to focus so much on, on that this morning, but I just want to say that he points out the two things, murder in the temper and murder in the tongue. If we can squelch those things and we can recognize the sinfulness in ourselves, then we can prevent murder. Now, we can sit here this morning and, and I can be confident that not one person in here has ever committed physical murder but how many of us have, have spoken in contempt and slander? And how many of us have had that root of bitterness in us that if given the chance would manifest itself in a harmful way? How many of you had to come up Martintown Road this morning? Y'all notice what they did in the center line on Martintown Road? I call them chatter lines, right? The grooves. Now why do they put those there? They've always been on the outer line. Now they're on the inner line. What are they there for? To keep you off my side of the road, doggone it. Get over. Right? But what is it? It's, it's two sounding strips. And if I move too far one way, right? That's what I get. <clears throat> Listen, the Father, by His Holy Spirit, puts those things in our lives. And here He's saying, watch your tongue, watch your temper. Watch your tongue, watch your temper. And if I can stay between those things and be undefiled in those, then I'll never have to worry about murder. But oh, how often we neglect our thought life. <clears throat> if I neglect what I'm, what I'm feeling inside, and, and, you know, again, we're saying, we're talking about burner preacher, none of us are murderers, but how many of us have a root of bitterness in our heart this morning? One that's been there for months and months and maybe years and years and years and it's just been building and building and building and when you hear that certain person's name it just comes up inside of you. If that thing's there, it shouldn't be there. It has no place in the heart of a believer to feel that way. Now notice the action to prevent murder. Verse 23 through 26, what is it? He talks about reconciliation. Reconciliation. Notice first the priority of reconciliation. Verse 23 and 24. He says, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something. Now, I love that. He didn't say if you remember you have something against your brother. If your brother has something against you. Even when, even when it's not you at fault. Reconciliation is important. As a matter of fact, it's so important it takes priority over worship doesn't say we're to neglect worship he says go and do this and then come back and bring your gift right but it's to take priority over worship Any, anytime I deal with this subject matter I always think Lord is this the day when somebody's going to get up out of their pew right then and go across the aisle and be reconciled to somebody is this the day when we're serious enough about this that somebody will get up and walk out of church and go to make something right obviously not but I always wonder that anytime I'm dealing with this subject matter. Will we ever get serious enough about reconciliation that we'll leave our gift and go? That's how serious God is about reconciliation. The priority is that it should take priority over worship. The truth is we can't properly worship and have hate in our hearts anyway. You can't properly worship if you're feeling that way about a brother or sister. Go and do those things right. Then talk, look about the promptness of reconciliation. Verse 25, agree quickly. Quickly. <clears throat> While you're on your way. Quickly. The 
calmed adversary. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're on your way with him. Do you care how people feel towards you this morning? I don't care if they're mad. Jesus cared. Notice the cost averted. He says he'll take you to the court and the court will take you to the uh, judge and then the judge will take you to the officer and you'll be thrown into prison and you won't get out until you pay every penny. I want to say something to you. Don't worry about the fine aspect of that, but what Jesus is saying is it'll cost you more to be angry than it will to make reconciliation. How many of you have ever had peace cost you one penny? Y'all understand what I'm talking about this morning? But I want to tell you, anger will cost you a lot. Of, a lot. Anger will cost you a lot. I've seen people in my own life have to pay a dear price because they could not get past their anger. So that's the contrast about murder. Secondly, the contrast about morals, verse 27 through 30, deals with this idea of adultery. Notice the, the attitude, verse 27. You've heard it said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. Now, I want to say something to you. I, I know better than to think that a, a group this size has never been uh, uh, affected by the idea of adultery. But adultery has always been around. If you think that there's any sin that's a modern sin, you're wrong. Other than a sin dealing with some sort of technology, every thought has always been in the heart of man. And this idea of adultery has always been around. Today it's even glamorized and widely accepted. Do you know our feeling today for some reason is the more frequent something happens, the less it must be evil? Do you know, you remember the story of Potiphar's wife when Joseph was in the house and Potiphar's wife came and came after him and wanted him to commit adultery with her and he even grabbed a hold of his cloak. We need more people with an attitude about adultery like Joseph had. This is what he said in Genesis 39.9. 39, 39, How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Two ideas about adultery, a great wickedness and a sin against God. Is that our attitude about adultery? Or is it blasé today? Oh, everybody's doing it. There's no big deal. Well, notice the adjustment Jesus makes in the teaching. Verse 28 says, I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, don't get caught up in the gender because this works the same way for women. Now, when I talked about adultery in the sense of actually carrying out the act, that probably eliminated a lot in the room. But when I bring your eyes into play, hello? So you understand what Jesus is doing here. Listen, the law says this, and to take it just in, its, in, that, in that very strict context, yes, that is the law. But I say to you, living as a kingdom child, living in the days of grace, that your eyes can commit adultery as well. Whew, how many on the hill you think straightened up when Jesus said that? Consider the eye, consider the heart. Again, he goes from the external to the internal. That day when they brought the woman to Jesus and he said, let you without sin cast the first stone. 
We can look around this morning and maybe know who it is that has committed adultery outwardly, but how many of us today would recognize our own sinful eyes and heart? Why does Jesus talk about our eyes and our heart? James says it this way in 1, 14 and 15. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. If you don't think what your eyes see and what your heart desires is dangerous, you have not read the word of God. Jesus is amplifying the idea of sin and we and, and the scribes and the Pharisees tried to lower those, those expectations. Jesus saying, no, I don't just expect you not to go and commit adultery. I expect you by the, by the power of the Holy Spirit to constrain your eyes and your heart. It's not enough today not to go and commit we need to be people who have, have no desire to commit. He gives us an action, verse 29 and 30. If you're right, I cause you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It says the same thing about your hand. I actually wondered what we would look like if we did that. Probably no need for a screen or words today. A lot of braille. But what's his point? Deal harshly with the flesh. Severe action may be needed. It goes back to the idea of flee youthful lust. Are we severe enough with our own self? I talked about the idea of, of punishment for murder. But how severe are we in punishing self and dealing with self, the flesh that is in us? Listen, it's not the devil making you do it. It's you making you do it. It's me desiring to do it. And we have to be serious in dealing with self. I enjoyed talking to Brother Jack the other night about, we, we were talking about some of those things that the minute we got saved, the Lord did away with. Other things took time. And I got a kick out of Brother Jack saying that cigarettes was one of those things that the Lord had to take out of his life. But he said he, he surrendered that, but he carried a pack around for two years just in case. <laughs> Am I telling the truth, Brother? Now, I don't know if I'd call that fleeing or not, Jack. But at least he had the pocket zipped, amen. He had to do two steps to get. And I praise God today that, that he is no longer even desires a cigarette. And this is not a sermon about cigarettes. This is a sermon about the flesh. And we will, we will sense God's conviction of life in this area. And we go, yeah, that's a bad thing for me. I better move away. I can still reach it. Right? That's how we deal with ourselves because here's what we think in our own spirituality. I will never fall in that area. I am a super saint. Flee. Flee youthful lusts. deal harshly with the flesh it's more important to preserve our spiritual life than our physical pleasures do you believe that this morning church don't just shake your head because the preacher said it do you really believe that your spiritual life is more important than physical pleasure then what are we doing about it 
What are we doing about the things that are in our home that cause us to stumble? The friends that we have that cause us to stumble. Those things in our lives that shouldn't be there. Are we saying today, we'll just set them aside for a day or two until I regain my composure and then I'll go back again. What are we doing? Are we taking a severe stance against our flesh lest it went out and overwhelm us and that we be drawn away by our own desires? Again, one of those we come to us, uh, 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 the next one that's a very outward thing, it's a public thing and we love to Look at people who maybe we know have gone through this. And I know many of you in here who have been impacted by divorce. Notice the contrast about marriage, verse 31 through 32. Furthermore, it's been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery now I want you to notice first the attitude this was the attitude give her a certificate of divorce notice the resolution there the resolve basically well there's nothing we can do to fix it but as long as you give her a certificate everything's okay that's how we are in America today well, we couldn't come to a resolution, so as long as we take care of all the legal paperwork, it's okay. Well, maybe according to the state, but it's not according to God. Amen. There's a lot that goes into this. Listen, I want you to hear, hear my heart this morning. I feel for you who are, who are in this circumstance, this situation. I know what you've gone through. The resolution was just make sure the divorce, the certificate is, is filed. But notice the reason. It's not here, but in Matthew 19, 8, we get the reason why divorce was even allowed. He said, because of the hardness of your heart. There it is. I understand some of you came out of terrible, terrible circumstances. I'm not standing here this morning judging one single person. But at the end of the day, divorce happens because of the hardness of the heart. Also, the repugnance of it, according to Malachi 2.16, it says God hates divorce. And before you look around and go, yeah, you divorcees, get the picture. Well, God hates all sin. We love to see other people in things that we think are worse than us, but I want to tell you, nobody's worse than you. And nobody's worse than me. We're all rotten to the very nth degree of our fibers. Save Christ alone, every one of us are wretched. So there's an adjustment Jesus gives in the teaching, verse 32a, and it's a time limit. The word there is fornication, and if you have a different translation, instead of sexual immorality, it's the word fornication. And so the time limit here, the implication here is, is that for divorce to be during the betrothal period. Just like we talked about in the story of, of Mary and Joseph, he, he considered in his heart to put her away privily, but they were in the betrothal period so that was the adjustment Jesus said the attitude right now is just write a certificate and anybody at any time can have a divorce it's that easy Jesus says I want you to think about this I want you to consider in your heart what takes place when that happens notice the addendum here he talks about the corruption of divorce the first part of verse 32a Whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. Latter part. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Amen. Can I say something to you? Divor divorce touches many. 
It's not just the wife. It's the wife, the husband, the children, the parents, the friends, the co-workers. Divorce affects much. It affects the mind. It affects the emotions. It affects the spirit, our faith. It affects our plans. It affects our security. Divorce changes much. It changes our personal life, our private life, our parental life, our social life, our spiritual life. Divorce is not just a simple, neat, and tidy thing. I don't care how the state packages it. It is a great great uh, deal of problems that it creates outwardly from that relationship being torn apart. Notice two things, the causing in divorce and the committing in divorce. Why different for the woman and the man? It says, causes a woman to commit adultery and the man commits adultery. Now, notice adultery, we've already dealt with this in the previous verse. But the causing, the reason it says causes her is because a woman in those days had very little option but to be married. Many of them had no way to support themselves, so they depended on a husband. So if she was divorced by her husband, oftentimes she was forced or caused to remarry. Now, the man had an option, so that's the reason it says he commits and she is caused. But I don't want you to focus on the commit and the cause. I want you to focus on what he calls it. He calls it adultery. Now hear me closely. That does not mean that you are in perpetual adultery. It means that that needs to be recognized in your relationship, confessed, and put before, put under the blood of Jesus Christ that you might go forward. You understand me today. There is no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus. What about the action to prevent divorce? You won't find it here, but I want to I want to say it for you. It's a marriage of commitment. Now that's another word Jack don't like. He don't like the word commitment. But it's the best one I could find. Not a marriage out of sensuality. One of the things I ask when I do premarital counseling is what makes you want to get married? Well, it better be something besides she's pretty. Because pretty can go away pretty quick. Because he's handsome. Well, just give him a few years. Hello? Listen, if your marriage is all based on attractiveness, you better start praying. Because age and gravity will catch up with you. So not only it cannot be a marriage of sensuality, it can't be a marriage of adventure. How idiotic is it we have a program, I've never watched one second of it, but I see it advertised, 90-day marriage or whatever it is, or 60-day marriage or what, whatever craziness. Oh, this is so adventurous. Listen, marriage may be an adventure, but that's not why you jump into it. It's not bungee jumping. Although it feels like it sometimes. (laughs) Only the bungees around. No, no. We get married for all these frivolous reasons. What is marriage? It is a man and a woman committing themselves to be one Two flesh becoming one with Christ as its center. And I want to say something. When you enter into that relationship, it's not easily broken. It's not a flippant decision. I don't care what takes place in the marriage. Listen, you can withstand all sorts of vileness and all sorts of things that are ugly on the outside. But listen, when God's in it, he can sustain it. That's what Christ wants for us. He says, look, our attitude about sin is all wrong. Stop looking at the things you see outwardly and look in the heart. He brought the focus to the inward and not the outward. So much of our judgmentalness in the church deals with just that, the outward. Somebody misses church immediately. We miss their body being here, but we have no idea why they're out. We don't know their heart. We don't know how they're hurting. 
So the question for us in closing this morning is, how are we doing in our hearts today? Not, not how are you doing outwardly. How are you doing in your heart today? That's where it all begins. Their attitude had become soft about sin. Today, do we have the same attitude as Christ about sin? God hates sin. We laugh at the things that God hates. We make a mockery of his word. We're going to look at three more next week. Same idea, this attitude about sin. Church, I want to open the, the, the altar to you in just a moment. And you come. If you need to deal with sin, listen. Oh, I know what you're thinking. If I go down front now, it's going to be about murder, about my marriage, or about my morals. So what? Nobody knows your heart but the Lord. He's the one you need to be right with. Don't worry about all these other hypocrites in here. Some of them are told to go and they won't because of pride. We're not dealing with pride today. Will you deal with him about our hearts this morning? Let's pray. Father, we love you today. We thank you as always for your word. Lord, we thank you for your truth Lord, yours is the only truth. And Lord, I know this morning that some of these topics, Lord, I would say most of us have been affected by one or more of these today. Lord, it's who we are in our flesh. Father, I pray that we have the attitude that you have about sin. Lord, help us to deal with our flesh today before we are carried away by our own desires because your word says that it produces death, sin and death. Lord, you've not called us to bear the fruit of death, but you've called us to bear the fruit of life. So, Father, I pray this morning as we open the altar Lord that some might come today and get serious about the idea of our hearts our eyes our attitude our temper our tongue Father we might get serious about sin as you are how serious are you about sin serious enough that you gave Christ to die for us Lord, that should be reason enough for us to be serious today. Lord, move among us. Prompt us, convict us, and change us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you need to come this morning, you come on.